All right, it is good to see you all out tonight. Grab your Bibles, we'll jump right in. Acts chapter 26, we'll start here. We'll be in a couple places. Acts chapter 26. Verse number 16, Acts 26, verse 16, and it says this, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear Unto thee. Let's pray real quick and then we'll kind of look at this a little bit broader. Um in this passage. Lord, just thank you again that we can gather together tonight. Lord, thank you for every person who's here. Pray for the many needs um, that are present in our church right now, the many difficulties, the many concerns, Lord, the many frustrations, the, the many aggravations at every aspect of our church. Lord, I just pray that you continue to keep a hand uh, upon us. Lord, keep that hedge of protection about us, Lord, and continue to guide us on our way. Lord, be with us tonight. I pray whatever I say will be only from you. Lord, I pray uh, nothing of me will be said. Just guide me now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul here in chapter 26, he's actually describing, right, to King Agrippa what happened to him. He's standing there witnessing to the king, and he gets to this point, and he's like, you know, I, I was walking uh, on the road to Damascus, I was on my way there at midday. Uh, all of a sudden, I saw on the way a light from heaven. And all of a sudden, I hear this voice in the Hebrew tongue, verse 14. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And I can see this story of the account that happened to Paul as he's describing this. Well, then I heard him say this, so I said this, and then he said this, so I said this in response. Then he gets to this, he says, but rise, verse 16, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. This is why. To make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. You know, it, it was interesting to me uh, looking at that verse because I, I think a lot of Christians need to grab hold of that. Because yes, that was a, uh, a specific, distinct call on Paul's life, but we are to be ministers we, we, we are to be servants unto God. We, we are to tell people of the things that we have experienced as well as the things we have yet to experience and the things that God will do through us. And I think it's important for us to understand, hey, we need to rise and stand up. I mean, God has come to us for a purpose. We were saved on purpose to make us ministers and witnesses. To God, I mean, I, the question kind of popped in my mind this week, and I think a lot of us have had a moment or two when the question comes to mind, what's the point? What's the point? Right? Oftentimes, maybe uh, if you're in a, a darker place, you'll say, what's the point of life? But really, my mindset was, what's the point in Christianity and being a Christian, especially nowadays? I mean, it's so bad out there, isn't it? Every time we turn around, some new thing is just beaten down on us. What's the point? Why, why do we even do this? You know, it's interesting, different ministries and, and different areas of the church, we could ask individuals, why do you do this? And they might respond with, I don't know. You know, and it's sad because I, I think even in a lot of churches, leadership and, and pastors, even at times, why do you do this? Well, I don't, I don't know. What's the point? So I want to give you the point. I, I, I want us to look at, at this tonight and, and maybe you've done that. Maybe you've asked yourself what the point is. Jump with me to Ephesians, back a few books Towards Revelation, Ephesians chapter number 2. And we can see uh, verses 8 through 10. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Why? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. His grace, right? Not my intelligence, thank God. Right? Not, not my abilities, thank God. Not, not my uh, character, not because of anything of my own, but because I experienced, I accepted the grace of God, now I can be saved. But I'm not saved merely, right, for, for my benefit, but I'm saved to serve Christ now. That I am going to walk in, right, these steps, in, in this path of good works in which God hath before ordained for me to do. He expects me to serve him now. You know, as we look at a question like, what's the point to Christianity? We, we can look at what was the point uh, of Christ, and I, I kind of started a, a study on Christ's miracles uh, in my own uh, personal study time. And, and as I'm looking through these different miracles that he performed, you can see some distinct things that stand out in each one. Every miracle, uh, there, there's three, I would say, characteristics of them that are for our benefit. But as a Christian, we can take these three characteristics of every miracle Christ performed and we can apply them to our own Christian walks with him. You know, what's the point is to discover purpose. To discover purpose. In the book of uh, uh, John chapter number five, it, it speaks of, uh, um, in verse 36, let me just read it here. It says, but I have... Greater witness than that of John for the works which the father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the father hath sent me. You know, purpose is defined as the reason for which something is done or something is created or for which something exists. That's the purpose. So when I ask a question, what's the point? And I'm looking at the life of Jesus Christ and, and through these miracles as he's, he's sharing with us and he's speaking to John the Baptist here or the men and he's saying, listen, I, I, I have a greater witness than just some stories that you heard. I have a greater witness than the man John, right? The, the, the great prophet John here and I, and I can tell you that these works that I am doing, that I have been uh, told to finish, these things that I am supposed to do, they are to bear witness of me, that I am Christ, the Son of God, the, the Lamb of God, the Anointed of God. This is who I am, and you can see that through which I do, what, that which I am, the, the character that I will portray in the book of Luke, we see kind of a story, and I'll read it. You don't have to flip with me because, like I said, I'll be in a few places this evening. Luke chapter 19, verses 20 through 27, it says, And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid upon an, in a napkin. For I feared the, I jumped down too far here. This is a parable of the 10 pounds, uh, a postponed kingdom we can see in Christ. There was, in verse 12, he said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Citizens were mad at that point. They didn't like what was taking place. This Lord had gone to uh, receive another kingdom. But then he came back. Now we get to verse 20. And, and the servants are coming back saying, I've done this with the 10 pounds you gave me. I've done this with the 10 pounds you gave me. Third servant says, I, I, I just kept it. I, I have kept it laid up in a napkin, verse 21, for I feared thee because thou art an austere man. You're a mean man. Right, thou takest up that thou layest not down and reapest that thou didn't not sow. And he said unto him, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money to the bank? 
For at my coming, I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him that pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. You know, there, it's an interesting parable as we're looking at the purpose, right? And we're looking at these, the, the, these descriptions by Christ here. And what is our purpose and, and there's some distinct things just in this story alone that could be its own sermon. But, you know, they, it, it didn't share in the interest, this negative servant, this wicked servant, this vile servant in the master's eyes. He didn't share in the interest of the kingdom. What, what, what the purpose was for his master, what his, his master was concerned about, what his master was excited about, what his master was eager for, this wicked servant didn't share in the interests of the kingdom. As a Christian, our purpose, and was something that we should really uh, get a hold of, is we should be as excited about the things of God, the things of church, the things of serving as God is. I mean, he's so enthusiastic about church and Christians that he sent his son to die for the church. I mean, that's something that we should have great interest in because clearly God the Father has great interest in it as well. This, this wicked servant, he didn't trust in the master's intentions. You know, I think a lot of times we lose our purpose as Christians because one, we're not interested in the things of God anymore, but also because what? The, the, we're, we're not concerned about the intentions of what we should be interested in. What, what, what is the intentions of God to seek and to save that which was lost? And now we as Christians, based on Ephesians 2, like we read, we are his workmanship now designed and created to serve our God. Those are his intentions. This wicked servant did not trust the intentions there. You know, the wicked servant, he was only concerned for himself. I was afraid. I was fearful of what you were going to do. I, I, I didn't like the idea. You're such an austere man. You're, you're such a mean person. I, I wasn't comfortable. I'm only concerned about myself. Not the results that the master's looking for. You know, this wicked servant, he did nothing to use the money. The, the, the gift, we could say, was, that was bl a blessing to him for him to multiply, for him to use and benefit from. This, this, this blessing that was given to him, he, he didn't do anything with. You know, we lose our purpose as Christians when the very things that God has blessed our lives with, our talents, uh, our abilities, our knowledge, uh, our character, who we are, and we refuse to do anything with them. We lose our purpose. You know, there was a, a story actually of a, a, a Scotsman who um, was spending time with President Ulysses Grant, Right? And as they're spending time together, he says, Mr. President, let me introduce you to this game that we've come up with. So he took out a little white ball and he took out a little stick and he put the stick in the ground and he placed the white ball on top of it. And he said, watch this, Mr. President. And he took a nice big swing and he nailed the ground and dirt flew all over the president of the United States. He said, no, no, Mr. President, watch this. And he swung again and again. He missed the ball and again he swung and he hit dirt out into the air. And, and again, he did it and about six times later. The president looked and he says this. He says, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. Welcome to modern day Christianity. There seems to be a lot of exercise in the church, there seems to be a lot of work and movement, and there seems to be a lot of things. But what's the purpose? What's the purpose of Christ in that? What was the purpose of us as Christians in those type of situations? 
They hit me good. There, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise. But what's the point? Why, why, why were, are we trying and, and striving for things in church? Is it for our own benefit? Is it for our own elevation? We want to be on this pedestal and people look at me and how wonderful I am. That serves no point to God. What's the point? We, we're supposed to discover our purpose just as through the parables of Christ, we can discover what his purpose on earth was. And that's in the same chapter as this story in verse 10. For the son of man has come to what? To seek and to save that which is lost. You know, God is not working to make us happy. That's not why God works in our lives. He works in our lives to fulfill his purpose. My purpose is to fulfill his purpose. That, that's what we need to wrap our minds around this evening. What's the point to this? Why, why do we even come to church? Why do we even do these? To discover what our true purpose is. To fulfill our purpose. You know, uh, um, what's the point is to display his power. To display power. You know, when, when Christ would perform miracles, right? The, as I'm studying out these miracles, man, was he ever displaying his power, wasn't he? He, he was showing forth the, the mighty power of God in his life, the ability to do those things. In Luke chapter seven, verses 19, down a few verses, it says, and John calling unto him, two of his disciples, this is John the Baptist, Right? He sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come or look we for another? Are you really the Christ or should we keep looking? And when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has, <laughs> Baptist has sent us unto thee saying, Art thou he that should come or look we for another? And in the same hour, that, 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 that's one of those lines that I always just breezed over in the past. Right, but what happens? In the same hour after these men came, after John the Baptist sent them and they came and they asked Christ, are you really the Christ? In the same hour that they came and talked, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. Right, and to many that were blind, he gave sight. Say, I don't know if that was in the same hour. Well, that's what Christ says in verse 22. Then Jesus answered, he said unto them, go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the death hear, the dead are raised, and the poor of the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Go tell John what you just saw. Go, go tell John what you just witnessed, the power of God. Right? Power is the ability to do something or act in a particular way, especially right, a faculty that inherit mental or, or, or physical power or quality. Yeah, you know, Christ was expressing and displaying this mighty power that he has. This, this ability that was not of his own. It was this inherent mental or, or physical power because he was the son of God. John 9, 1 through 3. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It wasn't that anybody sinned in his life that he was born blind. It was just so we could just truly display the power of God to the people. That was the point. That was the reason. That's why when Christ walked by, he already knew that this blind man was going to call out. He understood. There's a story of a, a missionary who was teaching a seminary class. A missionary by the name of Herbert Jackson and he told as a, a new missionary that he was assigned a car on the field that would not start without a push. 
said after pondering the problem, he devised this specific plan. He went to the school near his home. He got permission to take some of the children out of the class. And he had these children then push his car off. As he made his rounds about town, he would either park on a hill so he could just roll start or he would leave the engine running. And he used this ingenious procedure for two years. So for two years, as he left his house in the morning, he would get the school students to push his car so it would start. And then as he drove, he would make sure the park so he could roll downhill or he would just leave his car going. Two years. After a short time or after a while, rather, the, the health had forced uh, the Jackson family to leave the field and a new missionary came to the station. And when Jackson was proudly explaining his arrangement for getting that car started, the new man began to look under the hood. Because of the uh, explanation got complete uh, after he heard everything that the missionary had Jackson had said the new missionary interrupted and he said why Dr. Jackson I believe the only trouble is this loose cable he gave the cable a twist he stepped into the car he pushed the switch and to Jackson's astonishment the engine roared to life for two years needless trouble had become routine Needless trouble had become routine. The power was there the whole time. You're right. The, the, the power was always there. And only this loose connection kept this missionary from putting that power to use. The, a, a, a loose connection. What's the point to this whole Christian thing? You know what? It's to figure out my purpose and it's to display the power of God through my life. It's so difficult for me to display his power. How am I supposed to, to truly uh, uh, display his power? Well, Acts 1.18 says, after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you have power. Right? Power to witness of him, power to tell others about him, that power to serve God. It, it, it's interesting, it, you know, we read that uh, Ephesians uh, um, little bit about being his workmanship, but he, in Ephesians chapter number one, verses 19 and verses 20, it, it says this. Let me get there real quick. Ephesians 19, 20, and what? Is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which we wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Did this tremendous power of God is available to us who believe in God, who have accepted God. So when we make a, a firm connection, right? When we make that connection with God, then we have true access to the power of God, right? I, I always refer to, to God uh, sometimes when I'm teaching to the, the teens about how he is our heavenly father. And because I know who my father is, I have access to my father's power, Meaning things that he can do, things that he will be a part of, th things that he can make happen. My son uses my power sometimes. Will you open this bottle for me? My wife uses my power sometimes. Will you open this for me? Will you reach the top shelf for me? Right? There's something that I can offer that maybe she does not have access to. He does, he cannot fully have access to. We as Christians, the moment of our salvation, when we make that firm connection, then we can properly display it. We, we get the chance to show his power to other people. Man, look at the great things that God has done in my life. Look at the great things that God has done in my church. Look at the great thing that God has done in, in our church family. Look at the great things that God has allowed to happen. Look at all of these wonderful things. And because of that, when that happens, right? When we shine our light, people will look and they can glorify God because of us. 
What's the point of this? To discover our purpose and to display the power, right? We shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What's the point to this? Let, let, let's show God to people. What's the point of your church? To show you Christ. To show you who God is. To show you how wonderful and powerful. To show you the purpose that he's given us as a church body and family. To make sure that you're going to heaven one day. That's what we're supposed to be doing. What's the point to this? To develop principle. To develop principle. Matthew chapter number 11 Verses 20 through 24. It says this, and then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee. I'm horrible with these names. Terosin. Right? Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre of Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. You know, a, a principle is a fundamental, it's a, it's a fundamental truth. It's a fundamental um, proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior, right? As for a, a chain uh, of reasoning, it, it's, it's this development of who we are based on what we believe to be truth. That is, this is my principle. I, I believe this is truth and this is what I'm going to hold to. Right? It's this rule, this belief, it's an idea that guides our lives. Man, he's a strong Christian. He's got strong principles. Right? He, he's, got, he's got strong principles of things that he does. You know, it, it's kind of a, a convicting portion of scripture there in Matthew 11. Just those four verses, five verses, 20 through 24, right? As we're looking at that, if the miraculous things done in Capernaum had been done in Sodom, it'd still be there to this day. Sodom, Ooh, right? That wicked, wicked city, right? Hellfire and brimstone, Sodom. Lord, but, but for 40 people, for 30 people, for 20 people, for 10 people, would you just save some? No, there weren't even that. Right? But, but what happens? He's getting on to the church here. He's saying, listen, Capernaum, which are uh, exalted to heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. If they would have seen what you've been able to see. If they would have been able to hear what you've heard, if, you, if they had been able to witness what you have witnessed, they would have repented. They, they, they would have got right. These places had been privileged to see something, right? To, to witness something, to be, to be a part of something that made them more accountable. They were, Capernaum was held at a higher accountability than Sodom was because of what Capernaum had been a personal witness to, what they had personally experienced. There, 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 there was this, this <laughs> we could say, principle at work, this divine principle, if you will, this, this God-given principle. They were more accountable because of it, because of what they've experienced. We are going to be held at a higher accountability before God 
than the person who has never heard the gospel down the road. We, we as a church, as Christians, right? And each one of us, all across this room, each one of us have experienced different things through our Christian walks that make us then more accountable than others. Somebody who just got saved this year might not be as accountable to somebody who has maybe been saved for 40 years. Why? Because the person who's been saved for 40 years, based on humanistic logic, they've experienced more from God. They, they, they've witnessed more in their Christianity. They've been privileged to see something, to experience something. We are more accountable because of what we know. Scripture tells me I have a more sure word. What does that mean? If Christ, if we would have lived in this day and age and in biblical times, I didn't, I would not have had as much access to God as I do now. As, as much access to Christ, who he is. Why? Because he was in physical form. He was walking around. He was traveling. Right? He wouldn't spend all of his time in Bonner Springs hanging out with me. Why? Because he had a purpose. He was going to display his power. Why? He had a principle. Why? To win people to him. Right? People, we, we, we have to understand as Christians, our principles need, what's the point? We have to develop our principles. Right, All of these churches, and I'm not uh, belittling anything that if the pastor has sought God and prayed earnestly and they feel, you know what, we're just not supposed to have Sunday night. We're just not supposed to have Wednesday night. If they are convicted about that, so be it. But until I am, guess what, we're having church for one thing, but also why? Church is here to help me develop who I'm supposed to be. It's supposed to help me develop my principles for life, right? I, I, I don't just learn that after one Sunday morning service. I, I need it. I got a thick head, right? I, I mean, is it, don't. <laughs> my wife's like, oh, hey, man, preaching. Okay, no, but we have to understand. I, I need to be in God's word as much as I possibly can be. Why? Because... Hey, principles are easy to develop, but they're difficult to hold on to. I, I can have great ideas about what I should be as a Christian. And on Sunday, I can pretend enough, especially if I'm only there one service a week. You might think I'm pretty awesome. Man, I, I, I teach four services a week and guess what? I'm just as bad as anybody else is. But what am I doing? I'm developing my principle and I have to get hold of. And thou, Elm Grove, right? You, Elm Grove, for, for if the mighty works which we have seen, man, I'll look at all the blessings that God has given this corner, the mighty things, the, the number of people, all the souls saved, everything that we've been a part of which have been done in this church, if all the things that have been done here have been done in, you pick it. You, you pick the area in the dot. It, it, whatever the bad part of town that you associate with. You're like, those guys are a bunch of hoodlums. Right? Whatever it is, that, that specific area, you're like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm going to be like Jonah, Lord. I'm not going over there. Right? Those are wicked people. But if they could just experience what you've experienced, man, they would have repented. They, 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 they could have been right by now. We should desire to live holy lives. Live, live a life set apart. Live, live a life separate. Right? Uh, live a life walking with God. We, we should love the Lord right? because of what we've experienced. Because of him. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. That, that, that's why I serve God. Why? Because he served us by sending his son and dying for us. If he never died for us, if he never made that way available for us, guess what? We wouldn't be here tonight. Right? 
I, I, I mean, th th this seems like basic stuff, but at the same time, we hold on to these blessings and this precious stuff, and we don't want to share it with anybody. And if they would have just heard it, man, Sodom would still be here today. That's what Christ says. And those wicked people who, are, who, who have OD, those people who have died, those people who have been shot, those people who have uh, whatever the, the wicked thing that you could imagine, if they would have just heard the gospel, maybe they'd still be here. Maybe they'd be living different lives. Maybe they'd be something that they're getting criticized for by Christians. Right? Maybe they'd be something better. How, how foolish would it be Right For us then, because of I'm serving God because of his love, I'm serving God because of his grace, how foolish would it be then now understanding this principle that we can develop, right? I can develop this principle based on we've all experienced different things in our lives to be better witnesses of God. So then why would I compare myself to you? I can't. I shouldn't. How foolish would that be? Oh man, they're, 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 they're witnessing to those people. Man, they're, they're getting involved in that area. Man, they're, they're being that kind of Christian. That's amazing. But look at me, you're different people. What, what, what's this principle? What, what, what can we gather from this type of stuff? Right, we, we can't compare ourselves because guess what? God deals individually with us. We, we are individually accountable to God. Romans 14, 12. I mean, it's so pointed. It, it's just so direct to us. It tells us exactly the purpose. It says what? So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I'm not going to give account for Ronnie or Miss Pam. I'm not going to give account for my wife. I'm not going to give account for my son. No, but what? I'm going to be held accountable for who I am in Christ, who I have been as a Christian. And, and what's the point to all this Christian stuff? It's so I can develop this principle in my life. So then one day when I stand before God, he'll say, well done. He'll say, good job. Maybe we'll high five. I think that'd be cool. Man, well, one day we, we would be able to do that. What's the point? I need to figure out what my purpose is, just as Christ displayed his purpose. Why are you performing these miracles, God? Because everybody needs to know I am the son of God here to save. Man, well, what, what's the point of all this stuff? I, I'm to display power in my life that only comes through God. What, what was that? Christ was displaying his power as he healed the blind, healed the lame. Right? As he healed the mute, as he cured the dumb. Hey, all of these things, Christ was displaying great power. What is the point to all this stuff? It's so I can develop the principles that I need. Christ expressed principle. He's like, this is what you should be doing. This is how you should be behaving. These are the things that you should be as a Christian. This is where we're supposed to be. We are individually held accountable before God. So then those questions have to come in. What's the point? Well, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? If you say, man, I got saved. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You haven't figured out your purpose yet. Right? I, I, I mean, look, look to Scripture. Look to God. Understand. Well, it's, it's more complicated than that. Christ is very pointed on what we should be doing as Christians. He, he really is. And I don't say that to be mean. I don't say that to be harsh to anybody. Okay? But Christ is very pointed and straightforward. This is what I expect of you. He tells us all through Scripture. Go. Do. Serve. Be this, right? And then he tells us, okay? And, and then we get to those uh, situations. Well, how do I display the power of God in my life? How, how am I supposed to show this to other people? What am I really supposed to be doing? What am I really supposed to You know what? We have to have a strong connection with God. If you really sh expect to show God to other people, you should probably, probably have a good connection with God. 
right? Just like those first uh, ham radios that were invented for the military. And the guy said, well, as long as you are directly in line with the receiver, then you can hear your, your other person perfectly fine. But if you get a little bit away, it gets a little bit staticky. And if you get a little bit further away, it gets more staticky. And if you get a little bit further away, it gets even more staticky and you can't figure out what they're trying to tell each other. Hey, Christian, the farther you get away from God, the less you're going to hear. Well, I don't know what God wants from me. Do you go to church? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Well, no. Why don't you start with those things? And you'll get back in line with what you're supposed to be doing. Right? That's how we display the power. Man, God wants to work in us, but he can only fully use us when we have a good connection. We got to develop our principles. Man, we, we all want... Right To have good lives, for our children to have good lives, for our grandkids to have good lives, for our ministries to succeed. We want all of these good things, but we have to have principle if we really want to accomplish anything. If we really want to show God, express Christ to a lost and dying world, it starts with our principles. Right? How, how, how can we heal our land when we humble ourselves? When we figure out what's wrong with us? And then we get that right. And then, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people. I'm going to show people. They're, they're going to see Christ. They're going to walk in the Elm Grove. They're going to be like, wow, look at this church. They got a purpose here. There's some power here. There's some principles here. And what does that lead to? People getting saved. Lives getting changed. That, that, that's where we need to be. Hey, what's the vision for our church? That. <laughs> That's it. Grow a strong relationship with God and see people saved. That should be the vision of every single church, I feel. Are there small things that we could be doing to fulfill? Yeah, yeah, of course. Overall, what do we need to be doing? Man, let's get on fire for God. Amen. Let's pray and then Ronnie, you come. Lord, just thank you so much for this lesson tonight that you laid on my heart. Lord, as we look to our lives, especially as those who have accepted you as our Savior, those who believe. Lord, I pray that we take hold uh, of this um, and understand there is purpose, there is power, and there are priorities that we have to have to truly exemplify who you are in our lives. Lord, be with this time of prayer request. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.